Do I need to do a check? You're good, Jeff. We'll uh, we'll start here shortly. I'll play a video, and then you can you can go. Thanks, Lydia. Good.
Well, good morning. I want to take the opportunity to welcome everybody to the Next Level Egg Series. Uh, great start with some pictures, you know, with the sunshine on our back. It certainly starts to get you the jitters of knowing that, you know, we're only a few weeks away from spring. So timing is great. Uh, I do want to take, uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, those that helped put uh, today together and our team here. Um, I think uh, Holmes uh, Agro is always consistently trying to learn and develop our knowledge and, and share that knowledge. And you know, whether it's at the kitchen table, whether it's uh, in the fields or whether it's events like this, I think we're always looking for opportunities to help, you know, I guess build and, and generate some more knowledge and, and uh, abilities to build a better crop for, for the coming year. Uh, at this point in time, um, you know, I look back at 2021 and uh, look at the production and some of the, I think some of the barriers that we broke, uh, broke in yield production, you know, I think there's, there's always room for improvement and looking for those. So I think we're hoping that these next level egg series help us do that. So today I hope we can provide uh, some of those tools that bring some innovative solutions uh, to continue to grow our profits for 2022 uh, with the responsible stewardship. So please sit back and uh, make yourself comfortable as if you're at home and most of you probably are at home. So hopefully we can get in a relaxed spot and uh, take the opportunity to enjoy the uh, speaker lineup this morning. And uh, again, look for everybody to uh, have a great successful 2022 and, uh, and enjoy your day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Lydia Nordgraf, and I'm a crop advisor here in Stainer. Um, and just like last year, we are on Zoom again. Um, today, my colleagues Dennis and Brooklyn will be moderating our question and answer period. And um, I guess before we get started, uh, there's a few housekeeping items. So um, if you have any technical issues, you can call the office here in Stainer or in Orangeville and someone should be able to help you. Um, after each speaker, we will have a live discussion uh, with a Q&A period um, and we have time for about two or three questions and any questions that don't get answered um, will be sent to the speaker and we will send them out to everyone afterwards. Um, anyone that is a CCA uh, can, I guess, collect CEUs. There's a QR code at the end, um, so scan it or if you have trouble doing that, just send us a quick message and we'll, we'll get you the link. Um, we'll also have a Yeti prize pack uh, giveaway between the second and third session. Um, so I guess stay tuned for that. Um, oh yeah, the, the question box at the bottom or the chat box, you can ask your questions in there and we'll, we'll get them to the speaker. Um, I guess if you'd like to share any of our content on social media, make sure you use our hashtag watch it grow. Um, and all of these sessions will also be posted to YouTube afterwards. So with that, I will pass it on to Brooklyn to introduce our first speaker. Good morning, I'm Brooklyn Hughes from Homes Agro and Stainer. I would like to thank you for joining Next Level Ag. I would also like to introduce Jason DeVoe, who is the Application Technology Specialist from OMAFRA. He will be talking to us about sprayer nozzle coverage. This session is brought to you by FMC and Yara. Hello, my name is Dr. Jason DeVoe. I'm the Application Technology Specialist with OMAFRA, and this talk is about improving spray coverage in soybean. Some of this content also comes from Dr. Tom Wolf, who is the lead with Agrometrics Research and Training in Saskatoon. Now, assuming timing and product choice requirements are satisfied, improving spray coverage typically results in improved crop protection more lands on the target, we do a better job. Now for contact products specifically, like fungicides, which don't tend to translocate or redistribute, the region of influence is small. That means the area that is covered by the deposit is probably the only area that's going to get protection. And that makes coverage really important. 
So Tom performed a bunch of spray coverage work on chickpeas a few years ago that I think is really relevant in soybean. Um, there's lots of research that talks about spray coverage, but I, I like this because it was simple and Tom isolated some variables that are within the reach of any grower to do. Now the variety he chose was at Zuki and it's, uh, it's similarly dense and leafy. Honestly, as long as the morphology or the shape of the crop is similar to soybean, they're going to behave the same way as far as coverage is concerned. Now what Tom did was place water sensitive paper at three different depths, the stratum of the canopy. And he wanted to assess the effect of spray volume. So he put the papers high in the canopy right near the surface, which frankly you can't miss. And then about halfway down, so midway down in the canopy, and then finally down near the bottom. The sprayer he used produced a medium spray quality and they traveled around 10 to 12 miles per hour. Once the papers were sprayed, they collected them, they were dry, and they digitized them using a tool out of Brazil called DropScope. And unlike something like SnapCard, uh, this is a very sophisticated way to digitize water sensitive paper and uh, get as much information as possible out of them. You can see the report that they produce is, well, a little intimidating, but basically that this report tells you what droplet sizes landed, how many of them there were, what area was covered, and it'll even estimate how much volume actually landed on the target. Pretty powerful stuff. Tom sprayed using three different volumes, five gallons per acre, 10, and in 15. In fact, he went higher than that. We'll talk about that in a minute. When he recovered the papers, this is just a, an average response that he got. So you can see at five gallons per acre at the top of the canopy, eh, pretty good coverage. But as volume went up, there was more and more coverage on the papers. And that stands to reason. It gets, starts to get more interesting as you get deeper into the canopy. You can see that as you go about midway down, uh, a lot of that spray was filtered out by the top of the canopy, which you would expect. So there's less available to get deep down inside. However, as the volumes went up, there were more droplets available uh, and that showed up on the paper. Finally, way down deep in the canopy where it's cool and dark and uh, we're definitely interested in getting fungicide products, you can see at 15 gallons an acre versus five gallons an acre, there was a pretty big difference in how much coverage was achieved. In fact, uh, they went up to about 25 or 30 gallons per acre. It's not shown here. And consistently higher volumes meant more area got covered, even deep down in the canopy. Now, in the case of contact products like fungicides, you know, we can still improve efficacy without covering more of the target. And that's a bit of a mind bender, but hear me out. You've got to think about coverage as two different things, not just the amount of uh, area that gets covered, but how those deposits are distributed over that area. And we use deposit density to describe that pattern of deposition. So this is, um, a battleship game and I had this idea in the middle of the night and leapt out of bed and decided I was going to uh, take these photos as a great way to show deposit density and how it matters compared to percent area covered. So look over to A, that's the image on the left. The pegs show the deposits on the board or the target and that represents we'll say about 10% of the total target covered. And if someone came up and said I, I got 10% of the total target covered, is that good coverage? I would say, yeah, as far as the area covered, that's pretty good. But look at all the area that was missed. All those deposits are clustered into one spot. We don't have a lot of uniformity. Now in B, that's the same number of deposits, but they're spread more evenly over the target. And sometimes a, a good way to think about this is not so much um, the area that gets covered, but the area between the deposits. What are the odds that an insect could move between those deposits or, uh, or a pathogen would be missed? It certainly gets a lot less between B and A. Now C shows what happens when you spray more than once. If it's done correctly, there's still some residual left behind from the white or the first application. And the new application, the, the red would represent an entirely different coverage pattern, pattern, but still the same uniformity. 
you begin to see how overlapping and, and repeated applications can work for you. So how much is enough? Uh, research and experience suggests that a deposit density of 85 drops per square centimeter and between 10 and 15% overall coverage should be adequate for most foliar fungicides. So what you're looking at here is water sensitive paper that satisfies that requirement of 85 drops per square centimeter and between 10 and 15% coverage. Now you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity here. That is there are a lot of big ones and little ones. And that's a good thing because the size of the, of the droplet matters. They behave very differently and both of them offer different advantages. And when we're looking at threshold coverage, every deposit counts. So you would count the little ones with just as much weight as you'd count the big ones. Let's go back to Tom's work for a minute here. Uh, let's look at the average deposit density this time by volume. So we're not looking at percent area covered. We're actually counting the number of drops per square centimeter. And on average, at five gallons per acre, they managed about 53 drops per square centimeter, which according to that red line is less than we'd like to see. But as the volume went up, so the de did the deposit density. Now, again, uh, they looked at more than 15 gallons per acre, but they found that the area covered uh, maxed out between 25 and 30 gallons per acre, particularly when the canopy was closed and dense. But the higher the volume consistently represented higher deposit densities. Let's break that down a little bit. Let's, let's break it down into the different strata that he looked at, the top, the middle, and the bottom. At five gallons per acre, you can see that the majority of the droplets impacted at the very top of the crop. And again, no big shocker there. Um, the deposits, the droplets have to pass through the top to get to the bottom. So a lot of them just get filtered out. And you can see that 107, 32, 21, it just sort of dwindles. But the higher the volume, the more deposits we found, particularly mid canopy. Look at mid canopy between 10 and 15 gallons per acre. You can see that we almost doubled the number of deposits per square centimeter. And again, for a contact product like a fungicide, this matters. You can also see that at the top between 15 and 10 gallons per acre, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. That's because they sort of maxed out. Uh, eventually, there's only so much spray that a target can retain. And after that, you're just kind of jumping up and down needlessly on the bug, dead is dead. So you've reached your capacity in those targets, but you are still seeing a difference in the middle of the canopy. So that just goes to show the impact of raising your volumes in the crop. But I alluded to the fact that different droplet sizes behave differently. So let's consider this for a moment. Imagine just looking over your boom, uh, taking the nozzles perspective and look straight down into the canopy. If you can't see the target that you're trying to hit, then what hope does a droplet have of getting there? In other words, if the target is maybe a stem hidden four leaves under, uh, a droplet tends to move in a straight line. So how can it get past all those obstacles to arrive at the target? Well, the answer is not all droplets move in straight lines. Now consider for a moment a flat fan nozzle. Uh, I think everybody knows that a single nozzle doesn't actually produce one single droplet size. So if you get a nozzle and it says uh, it's got a, an average droplet size of coarse, it's a coarse nozzle. Well, that doesn't mean all the droplets that come out of it are coarse. On this really busy looking graph, um, lasers were used. They were shone, shone, zapped. That's probably not the right word either. A laser passed through the spray. There, that's better. That sounds scientific. And uh, refraction was used to determine the, the size of the droplets produced by that nozzle. And you can see here on average, they were about, oh, 350 microns. So that would be about a, a medium coarse droplet size. But you can see that some of the volume produced by that nozzle was made up of smaller droplets, and some of the volume produced by that nozzle went as big as 800 microns. But this can be a little misleading because it looks like there aren't many droplets produced uh, at the extreme sizes. And that's not the case. This is the volume produced by the sprayer or by the nozzle. Let's look at the number of droplets produced. This is the exact same nozzle, but in this case, we're counting the number of droplets produced. And you can see 
those very few fine droplets, everything under 150 will say, there doesn't appear to be a lot of volume there, and there isn't, but there sure are a whole heck of a lot of, of droplets because they all have such small volumes. It takes a lot of them to make up that volumetric fraction. So every nozzle produces a, a range of droplet sizes, but the number of fines that it produces is very, very high. And it's those fine droplets that are the ones that can move in unpredictable directions, the ones that can circumnavigate around targets to get to where they're going. The unpredictable droplets are the ones that manage to give us a lot of that penetration in dense canopies. Watch this video of uh, a nozzle producing about a very coarse spray quality. These are really big droplets. And you can see that they move in straight lines, just the way if you threw a ball, it would move in a relatively straight line. We can predict where they're going to go. Uh, they don't tend to blow around in high winds as much. They, they move in waves that we can predict. Now, this nozzle has a medium spray quality, which is to say some droplets are smaller, some droplets are larger. So when I start this video, you just take a look at the outer edges of the spray pattern. That's where you tend to find the larger droplets on any flat fan nozzle. But toward the center is where you find the finer and more numerous droplets. Watch how slow the droplets move in the middle versus how quickly the droplets move at the outside. So now we see why it's so important to overlap our nozzles 100%. So we get a nice blend of large and small throughout the swath. But you also see that the larger droplets at the outside moving very, very fast, don't spend a lot of time in the air and they move in that straight line, while the finer ones tend to cloud and move all over the place, and there are so many of them. And they move very, very slowly, which gives them an opportunity for them to move around targets and not just sort of slam into them. So we do want to see large and small droplets uh, relative to one another in the same swath. So what does that mean when it comes time to talk about the target. Well, not only do they move differently, but if and when they land on the target, they behave differently. The larger droplets have a very high spread factor. That is, uh, when they touch the target, they spread out. They don't just sit like a basketball on the ground, uh, and adjuvants can certainly help this. They spread out um, and they touch more of the surface of the target. When you start to get smaller, about the medium coarse droplet size, you start to get a, less, a lesser spread factor. So the, the bigger droplets have more spread and the smaller droplets have less spread. And you can kind of predict how, how much they're going to cover. And you see the sort of balance between uh, one big droplet versus many, many small ones. What's interesting here is this illustration, this is the same volume being sprayed in all four situations. You can just see the difference between the mechanical advantage of having a whole lot of little droplets versus uh, we'll call it a chemical advantage of having a very large droplet that spreads out. If you're using water sensitive paper to assess your coverage, you should be aware that while water sensitive paper is excellent, it doesn't tend to show spread very well. In this case, uh, a super spreader was used and three droplets were placed on water sensitive paper. And you can see that they spread about two millimeters um, three millimeters and four millimeters squared. Those are the areas covered. But when that same volume is applied on an actual leaf, you can see what the super spreader does. It's, it's a tremendous difference. So when you do use water sensitive paper, and I hope you do to assess your coverage, be aware that you're looking at a worst case scenario, uh, particularly when a product is formulated with a spreader, something to break down the surface tension of the droplet, um, any surfactant really, it, it behaves very differently on the plant surface. So we're beginning to learn that the larger and the smaller droplets behave differently insofar as how they fly and how they spread on the target. Um, it also kind of matters what happens when they actually hit the target. Just because you manage to hit it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay there. And you can see on this big waxy leaf, a, a coarse droplet or a very coarse or an extremely coarse droplet moves at a high velocity and tends to blow to pieces. It could run off the target. It could shatter the way you're seeing here. There are rebounds and bounces. Now, admittedly, this looks pretty spectacular. I could just watch this all day. Um, some of it did get left behind and that shattering effect means there's secondary and tertiary coverage. 
And that looks great, except you can't rely on it. It's really hard to make this happen in real life. It's nothing that you could um, try to do. It just sort of happens. But you can see that the larger droplets aren't quite so good at staying uh, put, whereas the finer ones are excellent for vertical targets and hard to wet targets. So at about 600 microns, you can see that there's rebound. But you know, it's funny, it just keeps going back and forth. There's another factor and that's survivability. Do the big droplets actually get there? Yeah, on a hot, dry day, they can be evaporating and it may even be a little windy, but they don't. that doesn't tend to affect them very much. The wind doesn't tend to blow them off course as badly and uh, they don't evaporate to any significant effect before they get to the target. But as you get smaller, yes, there's less bounce and better cling, but evaporation also starts. At 200 microns, you can see that there was no rebound. They pretty much stayed where they were put, but some of it evaporates before it gets there. And that's particularly true of uh, the very fine droplets where, yeah, they'll stick to almost anything and everything, but will they arrive is the question. They're deflected by wind uh, and they certainly evaporate quickly. So you can, you can see this spectrum of how larger and small droplet behavior and uh, retention and spread all kind of makes this a, a bit more complicated, but we don't have to go all that far. Here are some quick take homes for spraying fungicide and soybean. For a given volume, the coarser spray tends to deposit more volume, but retention and canopy penetration and deposit density gets reduced. That means the bigger the droplets, the more volume ends up on the plant but you don't get a lot of deposit density. It's one big drop in the middle and it could run off and it could bounce and it doesn't tend to get very far into the canopy. Whereas the finer droplets uh, for a given volume, they will um, penetrate more deeply. They will provide a higher deposit density, but of course, you know, the, the, uh, the worry there is, did they actually arrive? Did they get, did they blow away? Did they evaporate? So let's just, kind of park that for a second. We do know that higher volumes always seem to improve the area covered and the droplet density. So the more liquid you spray, uh, the more, sorry, the higher the volume used per acre, the better coverage you can expect. And uh, the deeper into the canopy you can expect it to go. But this tends to flatten out. There's a threshold somewhere between 25 and 30 gallons per acre where it's just not worth the investment of water anymore. You're not going to see an appreciable difference, but that seems to be the sweet spot. And speaking of sweet spots, it's the droplets that are on the high end of medium that we feel will be a very good compromise be between the, the whole coverage and drift scenario. So that was really quick and uh, I feel badly that I'm not there in person to talk to you, but I guess we'll have live questions afterwards. Just a reminder that you can go to Sprayers 101 for all kinds of spraying advice and resources. Uh, Tom and I run that site, have for years now, and uh, we're very pleased with the information that we can bring to you. Speaking of which, we're gonna stop this part of the talk now, and if uh, I'm any good at movie editing, I'm gonna tack on a live demo that Tom and I did a couple months ago for the Ontario Ag Conference. and. Uh, that should underpin what we were talking about with droplet behavior and the potential for good coverage. After which, I think we'll take some questions. Now we come to the live portion of the demo because if we aren't dumping stuff all over, it's not fun. We have three volumes of spray. Imagine this is the nozzle. All three buckets are filled with droplets. Very coarse droplets, medium droplets, and we'll say very fine droplets. Now, normally when we're spraying, if this is the nozzle and it starts spraying, I'm the one running back and forth over the target, but we can't manage that in here. Instead, we're gonna have the target run under the nozzle. So we're gonna show what happens when very coarse droplets are applied to a vertical target. Are you ready to show us target? Toro. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, spray, and you're gonna charge, and we're gonna see what sticks. Okay, one, two, three, spray. Come on back, let's see what's stuck to the target. I don't think I'd be happy if I was a grower and saw this. So the very large droplets, as we talked about earlier, they didn't adhere to a vertical target. We'll say Tom is not a wettable target. They bounced, they went all over the place, but they did fall straight down. They did move predictably. They even bounced when they got to the ground, but they didn't stick. Would we ever use such big droplets on a oh, vertical target? Maybe for a horizontal target. 
Like a soybean leaf. I like or that. A, or a pigweed leaf. Or even just a pre-emerge if you were soil mm -hmm. instead of a leaf. Mm -hmm. How about uh, we try this again? Sure, let's try it again. Okay. Now we're going to try this again. These are the same very coarse droplets, but this time on a sessile target or perhaps pre-emerge. Let's see what happens. Wow, you make a fantastic target. Why don't you climb on up here and we'll see what we got. Hey. It's slippery, isn't it? So this time, they did bounce, they did roll away, they did move predictably, but because he wasn't a hard to wit target, he was a sessile target, maybe a pre-emerge or a very small weed, we got a hit. They stuck, even though they were that big. Okay, we've done very coarse for a vertical target and a horizontal target. It's time to go down to the medium droplets. Remember, smaller, more of them. We've kept the same volume, so we're not spraying any more spray liquid. We've just broken it into smaller pieces. We'll go one, two, three, spray, and we'll see what happens for coverage this time, shall we? Toro, one, two, three, spray. Wow. Well, I'd say we have a greater droplet density. I'll say we have more percent area covered. But if you noticed, we also missed an awful lot. They went to a lot of places. Not so small that they weren't predictable, but so many of them, some did actually drift off course and go places we didn't predict. In fact, I suspect we'll be cleaning this up for some time. Would you say that's good coverage? That's good coverage. So we can see the benefit of going to smaller droplets. Absolutely. So we've done the coarse and the medium sprays, and we saw that the coarse uh, really had no retention on the, on the vertical target and some retention on the horizontal target. The medium sprays were intermediate. They had some retention on the vertical target and were, had decent coverage. Now we'll use a fine spray, very small droplets. Uh, Jason will be our target, and uh, we'll see where they stick. So Jason, are you ready? I think so. We're going to go on one, two, three, spray. Are you ready? Yep. One, two, three, spray. Oh. Wow, I have to say that worked better than expected. So we have, what do we see here? We have coverage on the front. Oh, we have cover coverage on your head. Uh, where else have we got it? Your, your eyelashes a little bit maybe? The worst on your dandruff neck. problem uh, in the world. Maybe do a turn, even on the back. So really? sometimes the small droplets in the wake of a spray will wrap around the back. If they're small enough, they can change direction uh, very quickly. So this is good for canopy penetration, underleaf coverage. Drift? Well, speaking of drift, it went everywhere. How much do you think actually impinged on me? That's a good point. So we probably got maybe a, a, a fraction, you know, some small fraction, maybe a quarter, maybe something. It's hard to, hard to tell from this. So if we could control this better, maybe air assist to create the vortices on purpose that wrapped around behind me. I've even heard electrostatics, although I'm still learning about those, to be honest. Anything to direct a find to its target would be a good thing. Certainly we got good coverage, but at the expense of a lot of misses. Yeah, so this is great. Uh, so we've demonstrated coarse droplets don't stick to, hor uh, to vertical targets, but they might stick to vertical uh, horizontal <laughs> targets. Uh, intermediate sprays stuck not too badly, actually, and the fine sprays stuck best of all, but there was a problem getting them to the target. Well, all right, that's it for the uh, demonstration part of our, our presentation. Uh, hopefully uh, you've understood some principles of the right spray for the conditions and the concept of coverage. Uh, obviously, I think in agriculture, Jason, maybe I'll step down from the chair. Maybe no, we can I think I've a... got one last thing to share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm not seeing any questions here. See, everyone loved it. After you see two grown men throwing styrofoam at one <laughs> another, what, what can you possibly ask? Oh, here's one. Impact of a sticker on droplet size. Answer, it depends. That's um, any of those performance-based uh, surfactants. It, if they're designed to be anti-drift, I'm thinking something like um, Li700 or, or Interlock, what they tend to do is reduce the population of finer droplets out of the spectrum without shoving the overall size much larger than it already was, which is super duper when it comes to keeping fines out of the air and keeping uh, drift, reducing drift. But with having done that, when those fines are gone, we lose any advantage they may have given us. And um, there's been some work done where the larger droplets almost create think of it as suction or a vortice behind them and we'll draw finer droplets with them um, down into the canopy. It's not something you can control easily, but it, it is a physical effect that occurs. So if we're talking anti-drift, yeah, you've, you've changed the spectrum of droplets that you're looking for. But if we're talking about stickers and spreaders, then you know that's a whole other ball to wax. You've changed the um, you've changed how the surface tension of the droplet reacts to the surface of the plant itself and it could increase spread it could increase runoff it, it depends what you add it to the tank I, I will say this it's not something you should fiddle around with unless uh, you've got some rock solid data that it's it's beneficial otherwise um, it could also harm your application and our our formulate our uh, registrants who formulate these products have already tried to capture most of the advantages of, of stickers and spreaders in the pre-formulation. So adding more is a bit dicey. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the difference in antagonism on the leaf surface with different droplet sizes? I gotta think about that question. I'm not sure I understand it. Antagonism on the leaf surface. So I know antagonism to be uh, a mixing concern when two products physically behave mm -hmm. uh, uh, poorly and maybe fall out of suspension or uh, perhaps inactivate one another. Not sure what you mean by antagonism on the surface of the plant itself. Okay. Um, Claire, if you could just, uh, oh, oh uh, she was dirt. thinking dust. Yeah, dust and dirt. I'm not sure how to answer that. Are, if, are we talking about fine droplets intercepting dust and dirt in the air while you're driving? We know with glyphosate, that's, a, that's bad because uh, you know, it, it tends to bond to the, to the dirt rather than to say the weed that we're after. But for things like fungicides or insecticides, I'm not sure I can answer that. I don't know what the reaction would be to landing on say a dusty or dirty plant leaf. Um, it's a good question. I've never considered it. Okay. Uh, nozzle selection for bean fungicides. Could you please rank uh, air induction versus flat fan versus twin nozzle similar to wheat fungicide nozzles? Hmm. Tough one because you're recording this, which means you know I'm, I'm being held to it. Uh, <laughs> I'll start by saying air induction is think of that as icing on the cake. You know, your cake is your nozzle design. It could be a twin fan. It could be a single fan. It could be an angled spray. Air induction can be added to any of those three. So you know, once you add air induction, you get a larger droplet, you get fewer droplets, and they all have uh, ostensibly those little bubbles inside that we've all heard about and seen. And what those do is they act like shock absorbers. If the droplet impinges, it's less likely it's going to bounce. Uh, it's less likely it's it's going to run. It is slightly more likely it's going to shatter into smaller pieces. So as far as air induction is concerned, it's a great way to keep droplets on target. But once you start to get to really coarse and fewer droplets, you also get poor canopy penetration. So think of them moving in straight lines. The first thing they hit, the trip is over. Whereas if you go to a finer droplet and there's more of them, the odds are they're going to wrap around targets. They may even land on the underside at the expense of you know, losing part of the population of them. So finer droplets and higher volumes are a great way to get into the canopy. Larger droplets and fewer droplets tend to impinge on the surface, not so great for dense canopies. As for spray shape, again, 
It depends. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a flat fan in soybeans at all. Uh, there is some small advantage to twin fan, but only early. So imagine looking down from your nozzle, like lean right over the boom and look down at the target, and then imagine the path that those droplets need to take. If a slightly angled spray gives you a better chance of getting under a few broad leaves and hitting stems or getting deeper into the canopy, that may have some advantage while the canopy is relatively open. But once you get, once you can't see in past the, the, the uppermost leaves, then it really doesn't matter what angle the spray is coming at, it's just gonna hit the, the surface. The odds don't improve in any way. Then that get further complicated by how high the boom is. If your boom is particularly high, they may have started on an angle, but gravity tends to grab them or maybe they fall behind depending on the wake of the sprayer. Um, to get any advantage off a twin fan, you've gotta be pretty close, just like wheat. And those are really intended for vertical targets like stems or wheat heads not so great for a broadleaf canopy that's begun to close. Perhaps some advantage if you can still see the stems. Uh, personally, I've never seen any compelling data for a broadleaf canopy that made me think that a twin fan is a better choice than just a single fan. Big answer for a relatively short question. I, I can't tell you what brand. In my opinion, a lot of the brands have experienced a kind of convergent evolution. They're all they're all quite good. I could rattle off a whole bunch of air induction flat fans that are 110 degrees that you'd be perfectly fine with. I think at this point, we're talking more about uh, your timing and your product choice than any nuance that a brand of flat fan would give you. Perfect, thank you. Well, I don't um, know, I either avoided that beautifully or answered the question, <laughs> I'm not sure which. <laughs> No, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, that is unfortunately all the time that we have questions for. Um, if there are any questions that come in, um, just let us know and we can uh, get Jason to answer those for you. I would now like to introduce Josh Linville, who is the Director of Fertilizer for Stonex. He will be giving us an update on the Canadian fertilizer market. And this session is brought to you by Agrico. Hey, Brooklyn, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Sounds good. Good deal. Say sorry. Uh, having to do this presentation from my hotel room in Orlando, Florida. We've currently got our uh, our big Stone X yearly conference going on, but wanted to jump on here and at least talk through it. And I don't have a presentation or anything like that because, guys, this world market from a fertilizer perspective is changing so quickly. Anything I would have made yesterday is honestly out of date by today. And of course, a big thing that we're always talking about is that. Fertilizer is a world market. We are a part of a world market. And a lot of times, especially when we get, to, like when I put on my, uh, my farmer hat, I start thinking what I do is the center of the universe. And we do the same thing from a fertilizer perspective. We think, oh, we're, we're dry here. We're not going to put it on or it doesn't work here. Well, what happens halfway around the world truly matters to what's going on here in our marketplace. And What's happening with the Russia-Ukraine conflict is 100% a exercise in reality of what that means and how that works. If we go back several weeks, and a lot of time talking about NOLA, this is New Orleans, Louisiana, and this is because a lot of the North America imports come through that region and get shoved up into through the system from that point of view. Um, it's not to say it's any more important, less important than anything else out there, but it's the most liquid. And so it's the easiest thing for us to watch. And it's the one that kind of gives us an idea of where the trends are going. Are we up or are we down? And a few weeks ago, the narrative on urea was it was bearish. Prices were starting to slide. We had, uh, you know, India had just wrapped up their purchase tender of about 1.4 million ton. And a lot of the world was sitting there saying, guys, there's no more demand. There's no way it's going to uh, help prop this thing up. And everybody is starting to build up inventories and everything else. The narrative was negative. And that's what everybody pushed. And fertilizer is the best way I can describe it. Fertilizer is a very immature market. And we probably spend just as many times factoring in, um, oh, what do I want to call it? Kind of emotional factors on where the price ought to go rather than actual fundamental. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way the market works. And it's just important to know that. And back then, the emotions were winning. It was going to go down and enough people believed it and it was it's a self-fulfilling prophecy but then all of a sudden the event of our lifetimes right i mean it, it sure seems like the last year and a half two years has just been once in a lifetime event week after week after week russia invaded ukraine 
This was a major deal because Russia is a huge exporter. They're an energy country. And I can tell you from my perspective, when I first started hearing about the sanctions, I said, there's no way this is going to work. The world is not going to unify. We just don't know how to work together anymore. Um, we're not going to see a major pushback. And if you don't see the entire world step up with the sanctions on Russia, well, the Russia tons are going to find homes. Maybe it's different homes than what they're used to going to, but they will find homes. And so your global S&D doesn't change. And so nothing should really change. Maybe there's some emotional movement out there, but ultimately it, it doesn't truly matter from a fundamental perspective. I have been shocked at how much the world has come together to condemn Russia and their actions on Ukraine. And the, what they are doing to them from an economic standpoint has been massive. And so we now truly, I went from saying there's no way they're ever gonna shut off Russia exports. And for Urea, here's how important they are, guys. They export over 7 million ton per year to the world market. That doesn't include what they use internally. 7 million tons per year. They are 14% of the global urea export total. That's big. And we are running down a path right now where we are truly shutting them down. I mean, my God, when they're taking $600 million yachts and impounding it from the oligarchs because they're punishing them so badly, chances are we're shutting out a lot of their urea. So that's a big deal. And then we couple it with another one, China. Since last fall, the Chinese government stepped up and said, world prices are high. We know world inventories are tight. We are shutting down exports of urea. We are shutting down nitrogen. We want to keep the product home for our farmers, and we want to keep the price cheap. So as they are doing that, they are removing their tons. China removes five, it exports about 5.5 million tons per year. That's 10%. Now we have to wonder, is China even going to come back? Now they're saying June is when they're going to do it, but will they sit there and say, hey, our, you know, Russia's our communist brother. We're going to stay in solidarity with them. We're going to keep our exports low or out. Guys, all of a sudden on the urea market, we are talking 25% of the global export market is shut out because of two. This is how quickly this stuff moves. This is how quickly it changes. This is why we are so... Uh, worrisome about what is going on there. And the longer this war drags out, the worse it gets. So that's why we're seeing these prices skyrocket. I mean, it wasn't very long ago. We had Egyptian urea paper that was trading, I think, down like $550, $600 a ton. As of this morning, Egypt sold a small block of 6,000 tons, probably destined for Europe, $900. We're not back to our all-time highs, which we said here uh, a couple months ago. We're closing in on it really fast. And the longer this war keeps going, the worse it gets. So that's what's going on globally. Uh, here in North America, honestly, and this is going to be something I'm going to say, and I want you to take it with a grain of salt. We're cheap. Our urea is cheap today. And a lot of people hear that and they're like, you SOB. And I don't say it a whole lot. I don't say it quite as confidently when I'm in front of a live audience. It's not cheap. I understand that it's not. But when we start looking at the economics globally, and look at where our market is. Again, look at that NOLA market. We are still triple digits below world replacement. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we brought in a tremendous amount of imports. Thank goodness we brought it in when we did. Had we waited like we normally do, it's a whole different ballgame. We're freaking out. And luckily, we've brought in a lot of what we need. But we are very, very far below. And what that's also done is we're looking at a urea market that is very cheap when we look at it versus U UAN and when we look at it versus anhydrous. Uh, at one point, now I look at it from a U.S. perspective. So the average nitrogen application rate on an acre of corn across the U.S. is 155 pounds. We were getting to the point where if a farmer switched from UAN to urea, they were almost saving $50 an acre. I mean, I think most of you guys have seen it before where you've seen farmers that would sell you out for a nickel, $50, you will make changes. And that's the one thing we need to worry about going into the spring is that these farmers are going to sit here and say, hey, urea is really cheap. If I put on my anhydrous, I know here, like at home in Northwest Missouri, we're about ready to start up a spring anhydrous. Once I sink that tool bar in the ground and I apply it, I'm stuck. I am planting corn. And these farmers, they don't know what they want to plant yet. They don't know what's going to be the best option, so they want to drag their feet. They might wait on anhydrous, which is going to be a boost for urea demand. UAN anhydrous is still very high priced versus urea, which could be a boost for urea demand. And that could be the one thing that kind of disrupts us and kind of catches us off guard. We're estimating our, uh, you know, our 
our import needs for the fertilizer year around like 5.6, 5.7 million ton. It could easily be quite a bit higher than that. And that's where all of a sudden the logistics come into play. And this is where a lot of the market gets, uh, kind of gets disconnected. We are so accustomed to this stuff showing up where we need it, when we need it, that we don't even think about it. But if we were to sit there today and say, we need an extra vessel of urea to meet our needs, think through the timeline of it. If we have a boat ready to load empty at the port and that port has got an open slot to load the material and they load that ship up and it's out the door tomorrow, it is 30 days before that boat hits the Gulf of Mexico. That's all of a sudden April. Now you got several days where you DT that vessel into barges. And it, that's assuming you get a slot, assuming the vessel doesn't have to wait very long. So let's just give it a few days. To get anywhere on the river system in North America, it's gonna take you two to four weeks. The further north you go, of course, the longer it's gonna take. Then you gotta unload that product into a terminal or into rail or into truck. And then you gotta transit that material out to the retail location and out to the farm gate. If we call on tons right now, on March 3rd, that material is not showing up on the farmer's doorstep until sometime in the month of May. The calendar is running out. Now, like I said, we've got a lot of stuff that's already on the way, a lot of stuff that's already here. Thank goodness we had to jump on it like we did this year that we haven't had in years. But we are still kind of, if we have a last minute demand boost, guys, we're in trouble because you don't have this stuff just show up all of a sudden. And that's where we can start seeing these urea prices really start taking off. We get on our own island. You can't get material to come here in time to meet your demand. Limited supply, rising demand. Econ 101 tells you prices are going up. So that's the big thing that's worried me there. Um, and according to our demand models, when we look at what our starting inventory was, what our demand will be, what all this different stuff will be, we figure we are going to come out of the spring season as empty as we ever have. Very, very low. In the past, we've had plenty full uh, stockpiles. We've had a lot of inventory sitting around there. That's okay. We had the insurance. If we have a bump in the road, boost in demand, if we have a production issue, all of this other stuff, that's one thing. But now, because we're going to end so empty, anything, any bump in the road, you're going to feel it very, very quickly. So that's the things that are worrying me there on the urea side. Uh, when it comes to UAN, another thing that goes back to uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, urea, they export about 14% of the global export total. Um, UAN, they have been, the last two, three years, they've been somewhere between 25 to 33%. Now, the number's not nearly as big. We're talking two, two and a half million ton, three million ton. It's not massive, but the global UAN marketplace is not massive, and they make up a big, big chunk of it so right there we've got that problem going on if we lose russia we lose 25 to 33 31 percent of the global export total big deal now all of a sudden we're sitting there saying okay inventory is gonna be very very tight well, what's even more important than that there is a lot of uan that is produced over in europe and one of the biggest things that scares me and this is on urea as well this is on anhydrous this is on uan Putin has not done this yet, but if he's talking about the nuclear card, don't think for a second that this isn't in the, uh, the deck of cards. He can shut off that gas pipeline over to Europe. Most of the European natural gas comes from Europe. And that's what this whole thing started up. As some people speculate, other people say other things, but that's okay. But the Nord Stream uh, pipeline, he wanted more. He wanted more money. He wanted to ship more at natural gas. If he decides to weaponize that natural gas flow to Europe, and turn it off because the West is starting to push back on him. The production in Europe has been able to high prices of natural gas. They've been okay. However, if he shuts that off, these governments are gonna have a choice. We've got limited supplies. What are we gonna do with it? Are we gonna give it to the industrial complex to make urea and UAN and anhydrous? Or am I gonna give it to my people to heat their homes and cook their meals? Guys, there's no decision there. We know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to take care of their people. It, rightfully so, exactly what they should. That is the doomsday scenario for the nitrogen market just in general. That is the scenario where all of a sudden we're just sitting there saying, throw out everything you've ever known about this fertilizer market. Throw out all of it. None of it makes any sense anymore. We are now talking about four-digit urea prices. 
And it's not a matter of if it goes up, it's a matter of how much it will go up. Stuff that happens halfway around the world absolutely matters to us here at home. Um, yeah, like I said, the stuff is just, it's changing so quickly and, and it's the timing of it's even more unfortunate because we're right here on the cusp of spring, right? I mean, we've got things, we're getting ready to roll. We've got the tractors ready to hit, all the equipment's ready to roll. And now all of a sudden the entire game is changing and it's changing massive. And we're talking about hundreds of dollar swings in a very short amount of time. Guys, when I started in this industry back in God, 2002, I got yelled at one time because the price moved five bucks a ton. I didn't warn the guy it was going to happen. You know what would happen if we called people right now and said the price of fertilizer is going to move five dollars? You better move. They'd hang up on you. Why are you wasting my time? Five dollars is nothing. I mean, we've got fifty dollars uh, moves, and we're not even talking about it anymore. That's become normal. That's how. I guess callous is probably the best word for this. But we're all just hanging on for dear life. None of us have seen it. I've talked to people who've been in this industry for forty plus years. Josh, I've never seen anything like this. This is asinine. It's, it's insane. Nothing like this has ever happened before. So if you feel confused and you feel frustrated and all this other stuff, that's okay. Don't worry. We're all going through it together. We don't know what in the world's going on out here. Now, looking at the phosphate side of the picture, that's another one. Unfortunately, it all goes back to Russia. They're a major player, player on all of the products. So when we look at the phosphate side, Russia only accounts for 10%, 11% global export total. Again, it's a big number, but it's not massive. But as long as they're out of the marketplace, and as long as we've got uh, vessels in the Black Sea being hit by missiles, you know, transit's going to completely shut down there. If you're a boat captain, you're not going to send somebody to freaking Black Sea right now. I'm not going to put my crew and my ship at harm's way. So assume that uh, Russia shut out. 10, 11% of global export total is out. It's okay. Sustainable, right? Same thing that China did on the nitrogen market, they did on the phosphate market. They came out last fall and said, same thing. Global prices are going sky high. Values are going all over the place. Inventories are tight. We are shutting our borders. We are taking care of our Chinese people first. Well, the problem with that, China accounts for one third of the global phosphate total. They are the biggest producer by far, and they're the biggest exporter by far. If you combine China and Russia, both of those two parties out, we are talking about almost 50% of the global export total is out, is gone. It does not exist right now. That is massive, guys. And that's why we're seeing these prices run up like we have. Uh, as of yesterday, we were at Gulf of Mexico, NOLA. DAP physical barge traded $895 a ton. Our all-time highs were set back in 2008. $1,100 is what I think the all-time high was. We're not that far away. We are 200 bucks away. And the way that we are moving right now, it's starting to look kind of feasible. That's a record I never want to see in my lifetime. But you start talking about cutting out half of the world export totals, this thing gets really tight really, really quickly. Now, in terms of what's going on here, uh, you know, you guys, unfortunately, from a Canadian point of view, you're stuck with us in the U.S. And we obviously put our countervailing duty case against uh, Morocco and Russian tons. Well, Russia's out of play. It doesn't matter anymore. Morocco's not going to come here. There's no reason for them to. Why would they come here with world inventories as high as they are, global prices where they are? There's no reason to come and battle it out here in the U.S. So we're not getting any imports, and yet we're still continuing to export product as well. We're very, very tight. And there has been a lot of discussion in the marketplace. There's been a lot of politics and things like that. We've got our midterms coming up from a political point of view. Uh, it, you know, two years since the presidential election, we've got a lot of congressmen and senators that are up for re-election. Fertilizers become a hot topic, and they're all saying, oh, we're going to look at this countervailing duty case, and this is crap, and we're going to do away with it. The law doesn't work that way. Now, the politicians might be able to step in and say, hey, I'm putting a six-month stay on this marketplace or uh, on this uh, countervailing duty. And we're going to give it time and see if it works itself out. But again, the thing that we've continued to tell people is that's fine. Go for it. Take a shot at it. Anything would help at this point. We'll take whatever help we can get. There's no reason for these products to come here. Maybe they send some the screw you tons uh, to the U.S., to the North America, just to, out of spite to Mosaic. But it's ultimately, there's plenty of mouths around the world to feed. There's no reason to come here and fight that fight. So unfortunately, as long as this war rages on there, it's uh, things are looking bullish. 
And the last one is potash. And I know this is one that's probably in the back of your mind. You're like, why do we care? We produce more than enough here in North America to take care of what our needs are. And you are 100% correct. In fact, Canada is the leading producer of uh, potash around the world. I think you guys account for like 36, 39% of the global operating capacity. You're massive. You feed the world. Unfortunately, we've lost Russia. And Russia accounts for about 20% of the global operating capacity. They're, they're number two. They're a distant number two, but they are number two. Belarus, you've seen them in the news. More sanctions. They are helping Russia by moving their troops through their borders to attack Ukraine. They're doing all these things. And they're already a part of all this. Well, Belarus is sitting there at 15% of the global operating capacity. We're losing 33% of the potash operating capacity around the world because of this war. Again, thank goodness we ha you guys have what, we, uh, what you produce. We're going to need it. But potash, it, it takes a long time to get these uh, plants up and running. It gives them a long time to go from what they're doing to ramping up, build a new mine, get new equipment into a, a, an idle mine. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. So unfortunately, like everything else, uh, two, three weeks ago, I was sitting there saying, I, I think that you know we're going to be sitting there looking at you know, demand down. I think we're going to be seeing prices starting to drop. The entire narrative changed because one country invaded another one. Something halfway around the world changed it just like that. Now, thank goodness, the one thing that's been bailing us out is the fact that these are jumping up like they have. You know, I know the one that I watch is corn. And several weeks ago, December 22 corn was floating around 550. Today, that number says it's been going anywhere from like 610 to 625. It's a boost. It's a great thing but it doesn't outweigh what we've gained on the fertilizer price. So the farmer is still losing. And I know you're probably hearing a lot of that. Farmers are angry, they're upset. I get it, trust me, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that, that was not a fun time for me, trying to explain to my family what was going on. They're trying to figure out, trying to make sense of it. I know everybody out there is doing the same thing. So like I said, I, I feel like I'm a little bit scatterbrained right now with the way these things are going, with the price movements that we're seeing. It's just all over the place. We've never seen anything like this. There's no down days. I'm getting to the point now where I'm setting my alarm at two, three o'clock in the morning just to see what happens overnight. See if there's any update on the Russian invasion. See if it's escalated, de-escalated. Because here's the thing. As quickly as it's run up, let's just say tomorrow morning, Putin wakes up and he says, ah, you know what? This is a big mistake. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Pull the troops out. We're going to help rebuild Ukraine. That was stupid of us. We will see fertilizer start falling out of bed. The day will come. But unfortunately, it, as looking at the tea leaves as we are today, it sure doesn't look like that's going to happen in the short term. So, you know, it, rather than just sitting here rambling on, um, I, I, you know, what questions do people have? What can I kind of jump on? What can I help explain a little bit more of? That's probably a little bit better use of the last 10 minutes here. Hey, Josh, just bear with us for a second. It sounds like we're having some tech issues. Yep. I think we're good there. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Perfect. Morning, everyone. So if those of you don't know me, my name's uh, Dennis Coffey. I'm a sales agronomist out of the Stainer location. And I'd just like to thank you, Josh, for taking the time to join us today. And we have a few uh, questions that we'd go over uh, if you had the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so given the current current circumstances, do you see any uh, reinvestment in the fertilizer manufacturing sector in North America uh, to secure the product that we're going to have here instead of relying on other countries in the global market? Or how do you see that working? So from a nitrogen perspective, I think it's going to be looked at again. Um, obviously, the last time we looked at it and actually did something was back in, uh, in 12. And that's when the decisions were made to build these plants that were in operation until 16, 17. The biggest problem I have with trying to build the plants in North America is the fact that we don't know what the hell we're doing every two to four years. You know, you look at it a year and a half ago, we had a different president, we had a different administration, and we were energy independent, right? We were building pipelines, we were getting to where we were producing all of our energy. We were energy exporter. Energy prices were very, very cheap. Well, now fast forward to today, and I'm not getting into the politics of it or anything like that. It's just the reality of it. Energy is very high priced now. And if you're going to build a nitrogen facility, you're building it with the idea that this thing is going to be operational for decades to come. And from our perspective, we're changing every two to four years. You don't know what to expect. So 
if you can, you know, if you want to build a world scale nitrogen plant, for example, you got to come up with what is it, probably now seven to ten billion dollars, and you got to find a place to put it, and then you got to sit there and say this thing's going to stay profitable for the most part through this next 30, 40 years. And when we're sitting here shifting on our energy perspective so quickly, it's hard to determine if you really want to put it here. So then you start kind of zooming out and saying, okay, where around the world do we want to build this? Again, you want to start airing towards low energy areas. Well, now we're talking about places like Russia, Venezuela, Iran, places that I don't even want to buy something on Amazon from those countries because I don't think it's going to show up. So it gets very difficult. Yeah, I think that the market is looking at it. I think there will be improvements on plants that are already in place, you know, efficiencies and upgrades and things like that. But as far as like a, just a brand new world scale nitrogen facility going in, I, I struggle with it. I, I think I'd be very jittery. Phosphate, we can produce more here in North America. Uh, I know that there is a place that they're looking there in Eastern Canada to try and build. Uh, I know down in Florida, uh, where I'm at now, I know that there are still plenty of ground, plenty of acres that has very, very good phosphate rock. But the state of Florida runs on tourism dollars. Tourism for people going to the beach, people from uh, people going over to watch NASA, watch rockets take off, people going just down the street to go watch Mickey Mouse. This state runs on tourism dollar and production of phosphate doesn't even rank in a top 10 in importance. So, yeah, we could we could expand those lands, but from the, their perspective, they're going to sit there and say, no, we really don't want to. And then potash, yeah, there's more ground out there, and that's actually one has seen increases in production. There's new mines coming online. It's just not quick enough. But high prices generally cure high prices. And that's generally from the perspective of, listen, I want to take advantage of this. We'll see a little more uh, production come online. Same demand, uh, higher supply. Prices should eventually come off. I think it'll come around. It's just going to take some time. For sure. Um, another one here. So, uh, yeah, you talked about the importance of Russia and China and the phosphate. Um, market looking at the North American market come uh, more specifically in in Canada that come in this uh, summer and fall. Do you think mm -hmm. the mosaic and the domestic production will will support the the market come uh, summer and and fall as far as the supply just amounts tons needed? Yep, I, I think that I don't think we're gonna have a problem with supply. I, I know that's a big fear, but I, I I think at the end of the day, mosaic's not dumb. Mosaic does not want to not be able to supply the marketplace because that is a surefire bet for the countervailing duty to go away. The government will sit there and say, you have taken a step too far. We're done. And they're going to shut down. And Mosaic wants they want that protection. So they're going to, I, I think we've got enough. Uh, I think we got enough product out there. I think we got enough production. I'm not too worried from that perspective. It's just a matter of what's the price going to be. Did we lose you? There you are. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> Having some uh, Wi-Fi technical difficulties today. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I think that's all the time we have here for questions, Josh. Uh, thanks okay. for taking I, the time. I think Jeff asked uh, real quick just about exports out of Russia, uh, how quickly those will be shut down. I think those have already been shut down for the most part. I, I think there's still some countries out there willing to take their product. But again, I think a good chunk of that stuff flows through the Black Sea. And when you've got vessels that are getting hit by missiles, you've got warships that are working out there. I mean, active warships. There's plenty of bulk loads around the world. There is no reason to put your ship and your crew in harm's way. So I think even if there's stuff to come out of there, I think you're going to have a really, really hard time finding ships willing to make that route. So I think that's already well on its way. Um, like I said, I've been surprised. I did not think an economic sanction war would make any sense. It would make any difference, but it's actually been significantly uh, effective. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for your time, uh, yeah, Josh. And, uh, and thanks for your uh, fertilizer market update. Yes, sir. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks a lot. At this time, I'll uh, throw it over to Scott Cahill, and he's going to present the, the winner for this morning's session of the Yeti Cooler Draw uh, prize pack.
Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of announcing uh, today's Yeti gift pack winner. And this gift is sponsored by Alpine Plant Food. And today's winner is uh, Doug Simpson. So uh, congratulations, Doug. And uh, the office will be in contact with you to pick up your prize. Over to you, Dennis. Perfect, thanks, Scott. Uh, so yeah, just a friendly reminder, as Lydia mentioned this morning, uh, CEU QR code for those that need it uh, will be coming up after this next session before lunch. Uh, our next session is sponsored by CNM Seeds. Um, the speaker is Graham Burton. So Graham Bur uh, Burton graduated University of Guelph uh, in 2017 with a Bachelor of Commerce in Food and Agricultural Business. Uh, after graduating, Graham had the pleasure of traveling around Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, uh, visit, visiting many farms along the way. Uh, Graham currently holds the position of Precision Ag Manager at Premier Equipment, equipment which is a multi-store John, John Deere dealership across Ontario. Uh, in his Precision Ag department, they cover roles uh, from simple GPS diagnosis uh, to uh, adopting autonomous machinery. Uh, this time I throw it over to Graham Burton. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Graham Burton here with Premier Equipment, and today I'm going to talk to you about what is Precision Ag from my perspective. A little bit about myself. As I mentioned, I'm Graham Burton. I'm the Precision Ag Manager with Premier Equipment, a nine-store John Deere dealer around Ontario. I graduated um, at the University of Guelph with a Bachelor's of Commerce degree in 2017. And then uh, I actually worked for Pioneer Seeds doing a sales agronomy summer term with them. And that was awesome to learn about that side of the business. And then I actually had the awesome opportunity to travel to Australia to do a small grain harvest with a good friend of mine, um, do a, harvesting around 20,000 acres in the wheat belt of Western Australia. And then when I came back, I had the privilege to work for John Deere Canada for a few years, few years and then now have joined Premier Equipment as a Precision Ag Manager. So today I'm going to talk about what is Precision Ag. Um, there's a lot of different variations of it. Um, it's, a, it's a broadly used term. Um, as you see from these pictures here from, from the John Deere side, this was a few years ago at Agrotechnica in Germany, and, and they started showing these concepts, we'll call it, um, and it got a lot of people excited saying, when's that going to be here? When are we going to have drones made by John Deere and little power units on tracks as you see that one there that was electric and that's a fully autonomous sprayer there. Um, it got it got us as a dealership getting asked a lot of questions and, and it was exciting. Um, but today I'm mostly going to talk to you about what is technology that is here that can be in the fields. Don't worry, we'll, we'll touch on some future stuff, but I'm going to show you here and, and how it relates to kind of some of these concepts and how we're building kind of that framework to get to get us ready um, as an industry for for this type of technology. So one technology that's definitely here and, and being used by by a lot of our um, I'll call them dairy and livestock customers is this Harvest Lab sensor. So it's it's an NIR sensor near infrared technology sensor um, that we can put on our um, forage harvesters spouts as you see in that picture there to test the different um, types of attributes in that whether it's corn silage or hay you can test for dry matter starch proteins sugars um, moisture all that way but kind of something interesting that's come about that john deere did in the last few years was this they actually can change the calibration curves on that sensor that we can actually now put on a manure tanker as you see in that picture there to now test for those nutrients in that manure so the np the k um all different ways that way. And so that's kind of a very revolutionary technology because if you think about the way we used to spread manure, you would, if you were um, good, you would you would dip your tank, send that off to a lab and kind of get your nutrient analysis and then tell your, your equipment operator how fast to drive to kind of give that application rate. But what John Deere had kind of realized, and I think everybody else had too, is that that, that manure analysis in that tank was very variable between the top and the bottom, no matter how much you agitated it. So John Deere said, why don't we try to make this um, sensor work that it can kind of sense the different types of manure going through it instantly and change actually that tractor speed. So you can type in that display, whether you want to 
as applied rate of however many pounds of N, it'll actually sense that and change that tractor speed to give you that as applied rate. So that's a that's a very neat technology that's in the field right now. We have we have a few customers running that now. This is something I like to touch on when when we talk about precision ag as a whole, and it's so basic, but it's kind of very humbling to think about. So what is yield? Um, everybody everybody talks about it in bushels, bushel, bushels. We want 200 bushel corn all that way. Um, but what do we get paid for at the port or at the elevator is is by weight. So it's kind of interesting why we talk about bushels because bushels is actually a size. And that's where, as, as you see there, the only way to kind of tell your combine and all your tech, your yield monitoring technology is to calibrate that sensor. It's a, it's a mass flow sensor on that clean grain elevator on those combines. And as, as those kernels are thrown up into the um, clean grain bin on there, it actually takes that calibration and says, okay, how many kernels have hit me to now give it a, a bushels? Because we all want the bushels per acre. So what Deer has done recently is put these sensors actually in the top of those um, grain bin and we call it active yield and it's actually weigh sensors on there and it's always weighing that grain and calibrating it with that mass flow sensor. So that's made yield data a lot more accurate into the future and this really is going to be the, the baseline for, for accurate yield data as, as we're starting to use it a lot more. We're going to need it to be very accurate. There was, there was a study that Amafra did years ago and they, they did it if you didn't calibrate your yield monitor for, for a year, how much can it actually get out of whack? And, and it was actually 20% error can be on that. So that, that's pretty big when you're talking high numbers of yield. And then if you're using that yield to now make prescriptions or variety decisions or anything like that, you, you want to feel confident in that yield. So that's why I always kind of bring the conversation back to precision ag technology can be crazy autonomous, but sometimes just putting some simple weigh pressure sensors in a grain bin can actually be revolutionary in, in the future. Um, tillage. Tillage is the uh, the base. It kind of seems to be the most simple form of, of farming there, but Deer has made a way of kind of revolutionizing it or, or bringing some technology into it. So this is true set tillage technology on, on John Deere, um, different tillage pieces. So I think there we see a 2660 VT um, true set. What it can do is, is not only can it um, manually adjust the different um, features on that tillage tool from the cab rather than having to get out and moving a rank or a depth gauge or anything like that. Um, but what it can actually do now because we can independently move those from the cab is you can actually do a prescription. So this is kind of something new that, that we have quite a few customers exploring this idea is could we make prescriptions for a field whether you do it off of elevation um, maybe for your sandy hills, you can do it off of elevation to kind of lift that tillage tool to be less aggressive into the ground so there's no erosion. Or, or some customers are even considering kind of a controlled traffic, um, dropping that tillage tool deeper into the ground to rip up that compaction, whether the combine went there or the sprayer went there or the buggy went there. So that's kind of a neat um, technology moving into the future that's definitely here in, in the field being worked right now, but, but definitely needs some more adoption. Application layers. This is something that's very simple, but is isn't kind of appreciated as much as as I would think. Um, so, this is this is an example of a customer's account. Um, they have everything that was done in that field um, recorded on here. All wireless JD Link is now free for every John Deere customer. Don't have to worry about subscriptions, anything like that. So, anytime something pulled into this field and did some type of application, it was recorded in Operations Center here. And as you see there, between 2020 and 2021, they got the tillage, they got the seeding, they got all the spraying they did, and then the harvest. Um, so, that's kind of a, a very simple technology that I think is going to become a lot more important moving into the future, whether it's proving what you sprayed on that field for. Um, compliance reporting or or even real estate transactions or or even just for your own knowledge knowing what you sprayed last year so this is this is something that's definitely here right now very simple um, but we we want more people utilizing it anytime that piece of equipment pulls into a field it can actually, as soon as it's pulling out it can actually send this data up to the cloud wirelessly no clicks of a button anything like that um, so so to talk about future technology is is this sea and spray technology. We've been kind of hearing about it for, for a few years here now, and, and I think um, in the near future, we're going to hear more about it. But what is this technology and, and how is it going to work? So right now, if we think how we apply, whether it's a fungicide, herbicide, insecticide, we mix it into our tank with some water, 
charge up that boom and uh, turn that boom on and go spray that field hopefully from corner to corner to get a good application rate on that crop or dirt or whatever you're spraying. Um, however, what is this technology going to do? So Deer's been um, has purchased a company called Blue River Technologies out of California quite a few years ago now and this is the first time we're starting to see it integrated into equipment. Um, what it actually does is it's sensing in front of that boom per nozzle what is there. It's making a quick on the fly decision to spray or not and then it's making that spray. Um, so if you think about that from a weed perspective, it's going to be driving over cornfield. It won't be spraying for 100% of the field, but when it sees a weed that it's trying to target, it's going to turn on, spray it and then turn off. Um, or it could be, as, as we're hearing from deer, it could be for insects. It's actually going to be using those cameras on that boom. It's going to be able to sense for insects, whether it's on soybeans or corn. Um, it's going to be able to sense for diseases, um, some mold, some ear diseases, anything like that. So that's that's a very neat technology moving into the future. Um, but from my seat at the table, it, it's a it's an interesting technology as a, as a dealership to support this. Um, Let's just think about this way. A custom applicator comes in to spray using C and spray technology for that farmer. Um, comes in, does the job. We think the job was done right, but then the next few weeks we see that maybe the weed wasn't killed or the disease wasn't taken care of. Now it comes back on to was it the equipment? Did the equipment not spray? Because right now we are usually pretty confident that when you go in there as an application rate, you, you got from corner to feet corner to corner. Yes, we see some misses and skips and stuff like that, but what happens when it's actually turning on and off to um, identify one thing or target one thing in that field? So is, is that customer now coming back to the dealership saying, I don't feel confident that my equipment actually turned on to spray that weed? Um, another huge side of this technology is, is the chemical, we'll call it savings of this. John Deere has been, been testing this for a few years now and, and they're saying that in a field it can actually save about 85% application rate. So that's chemical savings. Um, so that's a that's kind of a different change in, in the industry. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we walk through this change and with this technology is it may be not be about the amount of chemical that was used in a field. It's going to be about maybe a subscription to keep that field clean. Um, so this is definitely a technology that's hot on our radar. It's on our horizon. We're getting to know it and us as a dealership are, are kind of learning how we're going to support this. There's going to be a lot more cameras, a lot more wiring, a lot more calibrations that are going to need to be done. And then it comes back to the data management. Are we going to get a map that actually will show where that boom turned on and why it did it? There's going to be algorithms that it's, Deer's actually talking about that boom might have two different plumbing units on it and two different nozzles, two different solution tanks, and it's actually going to be able to make the decision to sense that weed, it's going to know in its back end algorithm whether it's a resistant weed or not, and it can actually spray two different chemicals on it. So that's that's a very neat technology that we're excited for. Autonomy, um, this new ADAR John Deere launch to the public down at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas a few, uh, we'll say weeks ago, caused a lot of interest, a lot of excitement. Um, us as a dealership are even excited, but it's kind of the wow you wow when where how is this going to work um so as as we see there that's that's on an eight r tractor that we actually can sell right now and, and deer has made the commitment that this is going to be sellable in field by by the end of 2022 so that's that's a huge um commitment to make and, and us as a dealership are excited um but as we see there it looks like it's going to be cameras we're, we're still learning how this is all going to work but there's going to be cameras on the front of that tractor on the roof of that tractor kind of sensing and analyzing what's going on. Um, we, we've actually seen now that it's actually going to be a live feed to your phone. So we're going to be able to see from your phone. If you were a, a customer, you'd leave this this tractor in the field for, for a few hours doing some tillage right now. You're actually going to be able to monitor it from your phone. Um, so what, what challenges can come with that? Well, do you have proper cell signal to be able to live stream that video to your phone? Um, what happens if the tractor loses cell signal? Does it stop or does it keep going until it finds kind of cell signal out of that, that poor cell coverage area? There, there's lots of things that um, we're learning as a dealership through this and, and it's going to be really interesting to, to support and see this in a field. Um, but it's looking like right now it's actually going to be run off of an app. Right now we have the, the Operation Center mobile app 
and it's actually going to be run off of that. You're actually going to get it in the field, jump out, and you're going to turn it on from that app. So that's a very neat technology that we're very excited to uh, to support moving forward and sell. Um, right now, it looks like it's just going to be for tillage into the near future, but I'm sure it'll adopt into the other things, spraying, maybe harvesting, maybe planting, moving into the future. Um, but that's a very neat technology that we're very excited for. Just wanted to say thank you for listening to me um, rant on about Precision Ag. I, I love what we do every day. It's exciting. Um, we have lots of technology here that, that a lot of people don't realize or utilize to its full potential, but there's lots of technology on the horizon that, that us as a dealership are getting ready to, to service, sell, and support. Um, they're my email, cell phone number, and, and Twitter handle are there. Um, thanks for listening to me and have a good day. Awesome. Well, thanks, Graham, uh, for that uh, presentation. At this time, we'll take any questions that have come up, and I do have a few here that I would I would go through with you. Uh, so, in that in your presentation, you mentioned the OMAFRA study that they found twenty percent error on combine monitors uh, if they're left for a year. What's the kind of target error that you're looking for on a on a fully calibrated combine monitor? Yeah, I would say that. Um, differs between between every customer, um, but we we try to aim for for right around that one percent. It seems some sometimes it gets up around that three percent, and then sometimes you can go look at a a scale ticket, and it's like wow, that's exactly what the the combine's telling us. But I, I would say it's probably around that that one percent um, yield error, if you want to call that. You always can post calibrate too, using using the data management side, kind of adding up your whole weights for the year and, and post calibrate in that way. Um, but for the for the yield accuracy side, I, I say we we try to aim for that 1%. Sure. Um, yeah, just talking on your your true set tillage system that you had there, uh, is that uh, able to retrofit on old equipment or is it uh, just on new implements? Yep, it is uh, retrofitable as a kit kind of um, for, for certain ones, right? It, they have to have the right hydraulics and electronics and stuff like that it, it can retrofit to older tillage equipment to a to a certain extent um, and then it comes um, as, as an option code on, on all the newer stuff uh, and then so every operation is different um, but on average what aspect of precision egg do you think growers should be looking at that maybe aren't aware of or or uh, that would benefit their their operation and I guess I'd be asking more specifically on the crop uh, cash crop side of, side of things yeah um, pro probably the data side um, it's it's kind of becoming everything Every, everybody's got their own interests or motivations of why why they want it um, as I mentioned in my presentation like we've had it here where, where customers come come scrambling to us um, saying I need to find all my data for the past years and 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 the reason is, is like they're, they're renting a farm and the landlord has asked like what's happened and, and for them not to lose that farm, um, they, they want to show their data or, or someone else has come in and bid that farm and, and shown data. So it's, it's so humbling that way for these customers when they've, we, we've tried to get them into this data world and they're like, no, no, not, not my thing, not my thing. And then for some reason to, to better their operation, it's now become a thing. They come running back saying, get me in this. I need it now. So I would say probably um, over the next few years or, or something that that every farmer should be using is a data whether it's for as, as we talked about their fertility um stuff like that you can't you don't know what to do if you can't see it it's kind of that um foot by foot scorecard um or or if it's for those crazy things like like real estate transactions or um yeah as i mentioned their compliance reporting a lot of our vegetable growers stuff like that are trying to use it more to, to streamline their compliance reporting there and and i'm i guess i'll even say this personally I try to get our growers just to collect it, just collect it, even if you don't do anything with it, because who knows in the future if, if there's grants, incentives, anything like they're out there that you got to prove you did this over the last few years, at least you'd rather have it than not have it. Um, so just just record it now. It's really it doesn't cost much to record it. All the all the displays and receivers are recording it. So just get it in one platform and let it sit there so that you can use it in the future, hopefully. For sure. For sure, makes sense. I'm not seeing any other any other questions here, so I think that's all all we have for questions, Graham. Just like to thank you for your time and and insights on the future of 
technology and agriculture, it looks like there's some pretty exciting innovations uh, coming down the pipe. So thanks a lot for your time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Uh, so I think at this time, uh, I think Lydia is going to put up the CEU uh, QR code for those who need it. Uh, Holmes Agro, I'd like to thank everyone who attended here this morning, uh, to all our sponsors that helped us put this morning's sessions uh, sessions on. Um, and then uh, you should have an email there with the link to go on to our uh, sessions this afternoon that would start at, at one o'clock after this after this lunch break. So we will see you all at one o'clock.